patient should receive enteral therapy is if they have a 15% or more weight loss, then they definitely should um, receive enteral therapy. And um, because their uh, intake is compromised. And um, when we think in terms of, um, again, delegation questions, which there will be multiple delegation questions on your NCLEX board. And in your book, I love it because they actually have delegation questions. I would highly recommend you look at those. That um, floated um, staff, floated RNs could do um, NG tube feedings. Um, they cannot, as we mentioned earlier, shouldn't be doing acute wound care, but they um, certainly could be doing um, those nursing functions that are within any RN's realm. So when you read through questions like that, think in those terms. Okay, moving on to shock. Shock really is a syndrome that is represented or manifested by a decrease either in blood flow or impaired cellular metabolism. Basically what happens is there is an imbalance in the supply and demand of both oxygen and nutrients. We classify shock uh, with regard to um, cardiogenic, uh, hypovolemic, distributive, and obstructive. And really cardiogenic and hypovolemic are um, related to low blood flow. Um, so cardiogenic um, is uh, low blood flow. It involves um, both systolic or diastolic dysfunction uh, in compromised cardiac output. So systolic is compromised in pulmonary circulation. Diastolic is compromised stroke volume. And some of the uh, precipitating causes can include myocardial infarction, cardiomyopathy, cardiac injury, um, pulmonary or systemic hypertension, cardiac tamponade, and also um, uh, metabolic problems can cause depression in the uh, myocardium. The pathophysiology of shock, and I did hand um, you a bigger one out of that um, handout. Um, all shock leads to SIRS, and if it's not stopped, it all will lead to MODS. So that, regardless of the type of shock, the pathophysiology is going to be the same. Um, and so that's something uh, to remember when you're specifically asked questions about shock. Uh, remember that SIRS, and again, it fits very well with our learning plan one, that any stressor to the body causes inflammation. And that's what's happening. That's what SIRS is, is inflammation. Uh, and then that, because of the, uh, what it sets off in that inflammatory process, it can affect multiple organs within the body. Early manifestations then um, can resemble acute heart failure. So those can be tachycardia, <coughs> hypotension, um, they can develop a narrowed pulse pressure, which simply means the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So if you go from 120 to 80 to 110 over 90, that's a narrowed pulse pressure. And they require increased O2 consumption um, in shock. When we do a physical exam, uh, we look for tachypnea, pulmonary congestion, pallor, the skin becomes cool and clammy. Uh, 
when we check uh, cap refill, it uh, is decreased. Uh, they may feel anxious and have a sense that something's happening. There may be confusion. Uh, we, if we are checking and if they're in the intensive care where it's likely they will be, they will check pulmonary artery wedge pressure. And there's also decreased renal perfusion and urinary output. And uh, that is also related to um, uh, decreased cerebral perfusion as well. Um, hypovolemic shock is also related to low blood flow. Uh, there is something called absolute hypovolemia, which is caused by loss of intravascular blood. Um, and that can be caused by hemorrhage, GI loss, fistulas, diabetes insipidus, which occurs oftentimes in head injuries, hyperglycemia and diuresis. And then we also have relative hypovolemia, which results uh, when volume moves out of the vascular spaces. Um, and we call this third spacing. What basically is happening is um, there's a decrease in the circulating volume, which decreases the venous return. That decreases stroke volume, which decreases the cardiac output, which decreases the oxygen supply, which then results in decreased tissue perfusion and impaired cellular metabolism. Um, with regard to hypovolemic shock um, and the body's response, it depends on uh, not only the extent of the injury, but also the person's age and general state of health. Typically what we see in hypovolemic shock is anxiety, tachypnea, um, and increase in their cardiac output and heart rate, um, and uh, difference in their pre uh, wedge pressure, pulmonary arterial wedge pressure, and urinary output. If loss is greater than 30%, then uh, uh, the blood volume is replaced. Uh, neurogenic shock is distributive shock. It can, um, it, so that is not low blood flow, but it's that the blood flow has changed. It's being distributed differently. Um, it can occur in response just to uh, spinal anesthesia. Um, it also uh, can occur uh, in response to massive uh, vasodilation. And what it does is it leads to um, uh, cooling of the blood in the vessels. Um, basically, what happens in neurogenic shock, the blood pressure falls. Um, that then results in bradycardia. And this is a key understanding of neurogenic shock, is that this bradycardia is unique to neurogenic shock. Usually what we see is the heart rate elevate. Um, the reason here that bradycardia occurs is because the uh, sympathetic nervous system usually compensates, but in neurogenic shock, it's the nerve system that is damaged, so it can't respond. Um, so the sympathetic nervous system is disrupted. There's decreased the sympathetic tone. Also, um, there's decreased heart rate. Uh, there's pooling that then results in a decrease in blood pressure, uh, stroke volume, cardiac output, and that results in tissue perfusion and impaired cellular metabolism. So if you look at hypovolemic shock, uh, this first thing is different 
but it results in the same decrease in per tissue perfusion and impaired cellular metabolism. And you'll find that with all shock. There may be a different cause, but it all results in the same thing. So in uh, neurogenic shock, they develop hypotension and bradycardia with this bradycardia being unique to neurogenic. They also will develop temperature dysregulation. Remember when we talked in the neural system, they can develop poikilothermia. Their body takes on the temperature of their environment. Uh, very typical of neurogenic shock. Now, another type of um, distributive shock or um, uh, shock caused by a, a change in the way the blood's being distributed is anaphylactic shock. Um, it's acute, it's life-threatening. Remember, we talked in Learning Plan 1 about the various hypersensitivity reactions. Um, this is one of those. It results in massive dilation, vasodilation, release of mediators, and increased capillary permeability. What we see in anaphylactic shock is um, a sudden onset of symptoms. They here again can um, have anxiety, confusion, um, they have a sense of impending doom. They may have chest pain and incontinence. Um, they may develop uh, some angioedema or swelling of the lips and tongue. Uh, they may develop uh, wheezing and strider, um, as well as flushing and um, paritis and hives, and respiratory distress and circulatory fa uh, uh, failure. Uh, the obvious and first treatment is to use epinephrine. So epinephrine is the key to treating anaphylactic shock. Septic shock then is uh, Another type of distributive shock, it's the systemic inflammatory response to um, a, an infection. It's usually a gram-negative infection, and it usually results in MODS, or multi-organ distress syndrome. Um, and it um, basically will end up in um, hypotension, even though um, they are fluid resuscitated, um, and there is uh, difficulty with tissue perfusion in the way that it is being distributed. Um, Gram-negative organs, um, organisms release endotoxins, um, and that causes that inflammatory response. And remember with the inflammatory response, we have release of cytokines and tumor um, uh, necrosing factors as well as interleukins. Um, that those cause damage to the epithelium and cause vasodilation and that um, increased capillary permeability. Remember that neutrophils rush to the site um, and platelets also um, collect at the site, and those can cause um, uh, increased coagulation uh, and decrease in fibrinolysis. Um, they have microthrombi, so mini clots. That can result in myocardial dysfunction and then respiratory failure. So basically, this is what that is saying. It starts with invading microorganisms and eventually leads to a decrease in perfusion and uh, impaired cellular metabolism. Again, the same result as with other shock. Uh, sepsis is a, um, and this is how it affects the, um, uh, moves into the myocardium. 
Uh, clin and the clinical manifestations are just those as you saw on that uh, schematic of the pathophysiology. Um, typically what we, is, sepsis is a leading cause of non-coronary ICU admissions. Uh, there's a high rate of mortality, as much as 40 to 60 percent of patients with septicemia. Uh, so manifestations include increased coagulation and inflammation, uh, tachypnea, hyperventilation, the temperature dysregulation. Um, so a person with septicemia may actually not have a temperature. So if you see signs and symptoms that might indicate um, uh, infection, but there's no temperature, you need to suspect septic shock. Um, decrease in urinary output, <clears throat> altered neural status, GI and respiratory dysfunction with failure um, being a common result. Um, Obstructive shock then uh, develops when physical obstructions actually um, obstruct the blood flow uh, and that results in a decrease in cardiac output. It can be caused by either compression, too tight clothing, or from abdominal compartment syndrome. We remember we talked about that um, with burns. Uh, basically, what we see in the patient is decreased cardiac output. Uh, they will have an increased afterload, um, and it's imperative that you do a rapid assessment and treat for that obstructive shock as quickly as possible. So when you think of uh, shock, Think of shock as a long, um, uh, a continuum. Uh, there are stages of shock. Um, the initial, then compensatory, then progressive, and then irreversible stages. Um, in the initial stage, usually clinical manifestations are not apparent. Um, changes are really occurring at that cellular level. Uh, what's happening is they're moving from aerobic or with air to anaerobic without air metabolism. Lactic acid accumulates um, and it has to be removed by the blood and it moves to the liver to do that. And unfortunately, it requires oxygen that is now not available because of the shock situation. In the compensatory stage, the body is activated um, to try to respond to the oxygen and metabolic changes. Clinical manifestations become apparent, especially in the nervous system, uh, in the uh, secretion of hormones, and in biochemical compensatory mechanisms. Um, so attempts are aimed at overcoming the consequences of anaerobic metabolism, um, and the body tries to maintain homeostasis. Um, with Hormonal changes, there's aldosterone and sodium and um, water reabsorption that occurs. There is increased osmolarity. Um, uh, stimulation uh, releases, uh, with increased osmolarity, that stimulates um, the uh, adrenals to uh, secrete ADH. And what ADH does is it increases uh, the absorption of water and it increases blood volume, so it tries to raise the blood pressure. Um, and this is a schematic of that compensatory stage. So this is the body trying to respond to that cause of either low blood flow, 
or obstruction or a change in how the blood's being distributed. Um, so baroreceptors in the carotids and the aortic bodies activate the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, when the blood pressure drops, there's vapor constriction that activates the renin angiotensin system. So it increases venous return to the heart, increases the um, cardiac output. Um, blood does not go to the GI tract because it's not important. So it puts the patient at risk for paralytic ileus. Um, the patient's skin may become cool and clammy, but in uh, septic um, shock, the um, uh, patient actually is warm and flushed. Remember, there's that temperature dysregulation in septic shock. Blood shunts from the lungs, um, and there's an increase then in the rate and depth of respirations and the ventilation for fusion um, uh, parameters are mismatched. Um, the sympathetic nervous system uh, increases myocardial oxygen demands and again because there's poor tissue perfusion that oxygen that is needed is not available by the myocardium. Um, if Perfusion is corrected with primarily fluids and other medications, um, then usually the patient can recover. If it's not per, um, corrected, the patient will move into the progressive stage of shock, um, and that then begins the, when those compensatory mechanisms in the compensatory stage fail and um, they're unable to maintain perfusion to the vital organs. So um, there's aggressive interventions that are needed during that um, compensatory stage to prevent the development to MODS, um, and we have to correct any of the precipitating um, uh, causes such as hypotension, um, vasoconstriction, uh, tissue hypoxia, anaerobic metabolism, etc. So as we move into the progressive stage then, that's when there is a decrease in cellular perfusion and the capillary permeability is um, altered. Manifestations then that occur with um, uh, the progressive shock is protein moves into the interstitial spaces. So there is interstitial edema and uh, profound edema with anasarca, uh, which is edema of the whole body. Um, fluid uh, moves from the pulmonary vasculature into the interstitium and that results in pulmonary edema, bronchial constriction, and decreased residual capacity. Um, fluid then moves into the alveoli, which increases the work of breathing. Uh, you're gonna hear crackles. You're going to um, uh, see a worsening ventilation perfusion. Um, car uh, the CO cardiac output falls, um, and that results in um, a decrease in blood pressure and elevation in the heart rate, except in septic, remember, or neurogenic, I should say. There they develop bradycardia. Um, an increase in respirations and a decrease in um, temperature. Um, also, the um, uh, myocardial dysfunction can result in dysrhythmias. Um, and when we look at 
arterial, mean arterial pressures. Um, a mean arterial pressure less than 60 is not good. That means that there is poor perfusion of the cardia. Um, and we determine mean arterial pressure by taking our systolic blood pressure and adding that to two times the diastolic pressure. Um, and then we divide that by three. Uh, that is how we look at mean arterial pressure. Uh, a mean arterial pressure over 60 is good. That means that they're getting adequate perfusion. Uh, but if dysfunction continues, they have dysrhythmia, ischemia, it can lead to a heart attack uh, and uh, failure of the cardiovascular system. In the GI tract, they can develop stress ulcers, bleeding, um, also, um, bacteria can be uh, translocated and they now have an inability to absorb nutrients because of the lack of oxygen. The liver fails, uh, it can't metabolize drugs and waste, they become jaundiced. They elevate um, the liver enzymes there is loss of immune function and it puts them at risk for disseminated intercoagulopathy. Um, and it puts them at increased risk for bleeding. DIC and bleeding dysfunction of the hematologic uh, system uh, means what you're going to look for are altered um, uh, lab values that can result in um, decreased platelets. Also, you might see evidence of petechiae with DIC. Um, and that tells us that we need to initiate aggressive treatment again. Aggressive interventions are necessary to again prevent progression to MODS. So it, if you see in the progressive stage, the development of um, petechiae, and when you're following the labs, you see a drop in the platelets. That is a concern, and that needs to be reported because they are at increased risk for DIC and significant bleeding um, in the progressive stage. So petechiae and uh, decrease in platelets report them. In the irreversible stage, um, there is, is increase in anaerobic uh, metabolism, an increase in uh, lactic acid, and an increase in capillary permeability. Uh, what we see in that stage is profound hypotension hypoxemia, as well as tachycardia. Um, uh, we can start to see liver or uh, organ failure, uh, and recovery is unlikely in the uh, reversible, irreversible stage. Usually they'll die either from respiratory or cardiac arrest. So profound hypotension, hypoxemia, failure, and recovery, unlikely. So um, we wanna make sure we uh, do a history and physical, uh, blood studies, elevation of lactate. Um, we also wanna look at the base deficit. Um, and also we can do EKGs. Um, uh, cardiac enzymes, uh, we can do chest x-rays, look at hemodynamic uh, monitoring, which will include CDC and metabolic panels. Our care will include um, identification and prevention of shock. So we wanna identify patients who are at risk, establish what is causing the shock, and then take 
measures to intervene and um, uh, control and eliminate the cause of uh, the decreased perfusion, either the low blood flow, the distributive uh, blood flow, or the obstructive blood flow. We want to protect the organs uh, from dysfunction. Uh, we want to provide multi-system supportive care, which can include oxygen, fluid replacement, and uh, mechanical ventilation. General management is uh, airway management, maximizing O2. Um, in other words, increasing supply, but decreasing demand. So uh, providing oxygen, but decreasing the reason for O2. Uh, cornerstone of therapy for all uh, septic, hypovolemic, and anaphylactic shock is fluid expansion or fluid resuscitation. Typically what we use is isotonic crystalloids for the initial resuscitation. Um, and normal saline is usually used, 500 cc per hour bolus. Um, trying to determine the type of fluids will be dependent on the patient. Also, um, uh, we can, uh, we want to make sure that there are at least two IV sites with large four needles. Usually we'll go for number 14, anticipating that we'll not only give fluids rapidly, but blood as well. If there is no response to two to three liters of crystalloids and blood, um, then we have to get them on monitoring and usually we will place an indwelling catheter um, as well uh, to monitor their urinary output and assess their fluid resuscitation. Urinary output is the best indicator that resuscitation is being effective. And remember, we've said right along that at least 30 mils per hour or 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour is the standard that we use for adequate uh, urinary output and fluid status. Uh, the goal of drug therapy is correction of the decrease in tissue perfusion. We can use vasopressors, the most common, norepinephrine. We can use also, also level fed. Um, and that is to achieve and maintain that mean arterial pressure of over 60 to 65 millimeters of mercury. Uh, dobutamine is uh, given uh, to increase my myocardial contraction, particularly in septic shock and cardiogenic shock and also for patients who are unresponsive to fluid resuscitation. Vasodilators are used um, such as nitroglycerin. Uh, nitroprusside is like isosorbide, it's longer use. Uh, to uh, maintain mean arterial pressure over 65 and it's used in patients who have severe vasoconstriction. Nutrition um, is important. It's vital to decreasing uh, the complications associated with shock. And the general rule of thumb is to initiate enteral nutrition within the first 24 hours. Parenteral nutrition is contra, in, if a per, um, uh, Parenteral nutrition is used if enteral is contraindicated or if enteral, um, they're unable to meet at least 80% of their caloric needs. And remember, their caloric needs might go up to as high as 5,000 a day. Uh, we want to follow protein, nitrogen balance, bun, glucose, and electrolytes. Now, specific treatments for some of the types of shock with cardiogenic shock, 
Uh, remember, it's low blood flow. So we want to restore blood flow to the myocardium uh, to balance the supply and demand. So here we use thrombolytic therapy um, to break the clots. We can use angioplasty with stenting to make sure that we get through any strictures. We can revascularize. We can replace uh, valves if they're faulty. Again, hemodynamic monitoring and drug therapy, which might include diuretics in order to reduce that preload on the uh, myocardium. Uh, we also can use um, circulation assistive devices such as balloon pumps and a ventricular assistive devices. Uh, for hypovolemic shock, the focus is on stopping the loss of fluid and restoring that low blood flow or circulating volume. Um, fluid replacement is calculated using the three to one rule, three milliliters of isotonic for every one milliliter of blood loss. In septic shock, our goal is fluid replacement to restore perfusion related to distributive um, shock. And so here we want to control infection um, as well as restore perfusion. Um, we can uh, use IV corticosteroids. Um, who re, uh, for patients who require vasopressor uh, despite having gotten fluid resuscitation and they still can't maintain their blood pressure. Um, antibiotics, again, are done, are given after cultures are obtained um, in order to um, uh, prevent infection. Glucose levels need to be checked, um, and you want to keep that below 150. Stress ulcers also um, we want to prevent with H2 uh, prophylaxis. In neuroshock, um, we want to um, uh, Due to um, spinal cord injury, we want to stabilize the spine and um, treat with uh, the hypotension and bradycardia with um, vasopressors and atropine. We use fluids cautiously in neurogenic shock because remember, shock is not related to fluid loss in neurogenic shock. Also remember that they can have those um, temperature dysfunction, so we want to monitor them for hypothermia. <clears throat> and uh, let me just step back to um, a septic shock or um, uh, to septic shock for a second. Um, with regard to septic shock, um, uh, DVT prophylaxis, as well for other shots, but um, DVT prophylaxis is very important. PPIs are oftentimes given to prevent um, uh, bleeding risk factors and to those who are on DVT prophylaxis. And in order to um, check the effectiveness of PPIs um, for diminishing bleeding risk factors, you actually should check stools for occult um, for patients who are on PPIs. Um, PPI examples would be Prilosec, Protonix, or uh, Pantoprozole is another. Also, priorities in managing septic shock, you would want to titrate their oxygen in order to get them uh, to over 95%. Aggressive fluid resuscitation, 
Uh, they might get as many as much as 2,000 mils per 30 minutes. Vasopressors such as norepinephrine. Again, blood and urine cultures are done before you give antibiotics. Antibiotics that might be used for septicemia are the big guns such as Banco. Um, and uh, antibiotics are a very important part of septic uh, shock. Usually the goal is to start those antibiotics within one, the first hour if there's suspected sepsis. Um, and usually you start them just with a broad antibiotic. You get the culture and sensitivity first, then start them on a broad antibiotic. Then when the sensitivity comes back, you look at that and you change your antibiotic at that point uh, so that you have the most effective antibiotic. But still, you would start them, get the culture sensitivity, start them on that. So again, with sepsis, t get their, um, you worry about their airway, get their sats up, um, replace the fluid volume, you get vasopressors to deal um, with that blood pressure, you get uh, uh, blood and urine cultures, you start your antibiotic, um, and then change it if necessary. Now, back to neurogenic, well actually we're gonna move on to anaphylactic. Remember we said epinephrine is usually the number one intervention. Um, and uh, our goal is to prevent and uh, treat. These patients may require um, uh, additional meds, but the priority in anaphylaxis is airway. When they um, have respiratory distress, um, uh, then of course give epinephrine, start IV fluids, then give them antihistamines or diphenhydramine uh, and get them on uh, monitoring uh, for EKG. So there are different priorities based on shock. Um, so anaphylaxis, airway, epinephrine, IV fluids. Then look at other drugs such as diphenhydramine um, and you wanna monitor them with EKG. With obstructive um, shock, early recognition and treatment again is important. Uh, mechanical decompression, radiation uh, or removal of mass and decompressive laparotomies. So when we look at nursing assessment, obviously ABCs, focused assessments, um, we want to look at the history of what caused the shock, what kind of pre-hospital care did they receive, are they up to date on their vaccinations, what kind of allergies do they have. Um, you look at their system, uh, system review. From a neuro standpoint, you want to uh, check their orientation. What is especially important to evaluate is whether or not the treatment is being effective. Um, and that's even more important than doing blood pressure, um, uh, checking SATs, et cetera. Uh, checking their orientation, their level of consciousness, their restlessness, their anxiety, if those are better and improved, it's likely that what you're treating them with is working. Uh, with regard, I'm gonna just move to, I don't, here's um, the neural, the cardiac status, um, you wanna check blood pressure and pulse. Um, usually they're placed on continuous EKGs. With regard to the respiratory status, you watch for symptoms of um, acidosis such as low pH and low PaO3. 
uh, CO2, look to see if they are hyperventilating. They may need intubation and mechanical ventilation. So a lot of times we also have them on continuous pulse ox in order to monitor that. From a renal standpoint, you want to check hourly urine outputs. Again, remember that minimal 30 cc's per hour and that three to one fluid resuscitation rule. Orthostatic hypotension is an early symptom of shock and um, the way we treat that is by giving fluids. Um, the integument, um, it's important that we check body temp, um, we assess their anxiety, their fear, um, and uh, we want to make sure that we are identifying patients who are at risk. I'm going to just move through that. Um, the elderly, patients with um, significant injury, those who are immunocompromised, um, are all at significant risk. Now I want you to take out that handout about um, the SIRS and MODS. And um, I don't have a copy of, um, on the, uh, I think it's on your um, CHA-2, but basically with uh, uh, systemic SIRS and MOD, remember that SIRS is an inflammatory response to um, what is happening in shock. And it's a generalized inflammation in the organs, and those organs are usually remote from the initial insult. Triggers uh, for those include um, tissue trauma, burns, crush injuries, surgical procedures, abscesses. Um, there's any number of triggers for those. And what happens with that inflammatory response, it leads to the um, malfunction of at least one organ and then eventually two to all organs. So MODS is when homeostasis, the body can no longer maintain homeostasis. It results from shock and then SIRS. Collaborative care involves, um, and once they move into MODS, uh, the prognosis is pretty poor. Um, the goal is to prevent progression from SIRS to MODS. Uh, early deterioration and detection of organ dysfunction is paramount. Infection control, strict asepsis, avoiding invasive lines, um, and aggressive intervention if um, infection is uh, suspected is important. You also want to maintain tissue oxygenation. Uh, balancing O2, uh, sometimes sedatives, mechanical ventilation, analgesics and rest are necessary. You need to meet their nutritional needs. And again, enteral nutrition within the first 24 hours. And you need to support those failing organs. So aggressive oxygen, mechanical um, ventilation, treat DIC. Again, remember you're watching for um, petechiae and other symptoms, and they may have to go on dialysis. Now briefly, I want to go over, and I don't have time to go over, um, uh, get to the um, PowerPoint, but the ill child in the hospital and other care settings, some important tips to remember are nurses that are working with uh, children in the home care setting really should have some hospital experience. They should be independent thinkers um, and decision makers. 
They should be skilled in clinical documentation, communication, and teaching. Uh, understand cultural competency and understand differences in socioeconomic backgrounds. Understand that children may regress in illness. Uh, they should understand Erickson's growth and development. Remember that infants and toddlers do have a separation anxiety. They are fearful of injury and pain. Uh, they fear loss of control. Preschoolers, um, separation anxiety is less obvious, uh, but they still fear injury and pain, especially mutilization. And they can believe that illness occurs because of something they have done, preschoolers. Uh, their imagination is quite active and so be aware of that. School-age children um, do suffer from uh, separation. They fear body disability and death. They ask relevant questions. They want to know the reasons for tests and procedures. And in adolescence, separation, not from parents, but from peers is very important. Remember in home care that nurses are guests in patients' homes. Um, preparation and training of the parents and the family is paramount in allowing children to go home with home care and when you are considering sending children with home care. Children need to have designated safe places when they're in the hospital. So. Treatment should be done in treatment rooms, not in their um, playrooms or in their room, their um, uh, uh, assigned room. Uh, remember that their perceptions, their age, their developmental level, previous experiences, their abilities to cope um, and family responses can affect um, their response to hospitalization. Play is important for the ill child. And when you're planning goals for children, um, not only uh, does the child, but the family and all healthcare professionals need to be on the same page uh, with goals. And when we're talking about chronic illness, um, obviously goals for the child will be normalization and the most optimal quality of life possible. Um, for families, you want families to stay intact and to be as normal as possible and again to function as at, at optimal levels as possible. Techniques to accomplish that include therapeutic play, uh, therapeutic art. Also, hospitals can provide environments that provide playrooms and um, opportunities for learning. Frequently when we see a child who's terminal, parents might try and withhold information from them. The key there is to be honest. Children who are terminal usually know they're terminal. Um, and so open, honest communication is encouraged. And sometimes you have to talk to the parent about um, maintaining that honesty. Remember that siblings can't be um, take, um, forgotten about. They also can. Um, uh, manifest regression, uh, allow them to express negative feelings because they have feelings um, when in fact they are at times being neglected. Um, you need to help parents acknowledge impending death. Sometimes they're in denial. Um, allow communication of your feelings when you're working with children who are dying. It's okay to share feelings with 
the parents. Um, understand, try to understand the family and parental dynamics. Obviously, pain control is very important when dealing with death and dying. And um, access to the child when they're in that circumstance is very important. So, you know, uh, they can come in and visit at any time. After death care is also important. Allow the family to hold the child. Allow the family to participate in washing or caring for the child after death. Um, allow them to as much time as they need in order to accept um, that the death has occurred. You are going to um, be uh, need to be aware and help them move through the process of grieving. You also need to help and allow yourself to grieve. And so uh, support groups are important. Also, it's important when caring for a dying child that you work with um, others that you not take on that responsibility independently. And that is it. All right. We'll have the exam on um, Thursday. I will. Um, we'll also do that after test review uh, because I want you to get to know what um, is being. Uh, you know, what are the correct answers? I think that's a very important learning opportunity. Um, it doesn't take long, as you all know.